Welcome everyone, my name is Jack Rico and you're listening to Lucky Episode 7 of Highly Relevant with Jack Rico. This is the podcast where I interview the people and discuss the moments that are shaping our American and Latino pop culture. This week's show is packed with great guests at the top of their game and they're all Hispanic. Actor Mark Consuelos, whose new show Pitch premiered this week on Fox, talks to me about what it's like to co-host the most coveted seat in morning television right now. Plus, his opinion on whether he feels more Hispanic or American, and his answer on what his favorite album is will leave you crying. I also caught up with Jane the Virgin's Latin lover. Two-time Emmy-nominated voice narrator Anthony Mendez tells me what his second Emmy nomination meant to him his involvement with Disney's first Latina princess, and why his decision to leave the New York area for Hollywood was a tough one. And finally, have you ever wondered why there are barely any people of color on air and off in national newsrooms today? Is it management or is it us? What can we do to fix it? I discussed the important matter with former New York Times and current CNN digital reporter on race and inequality, Tanzina Vega, on the tribulations of being a minority in the media industry today. That and a recap of all the best pop culture stories that you might have missed this week. Film, television, and stage actor Mark Consuelos is a look at the modern-day star. He's one of the rare actors who possesses a unique ability to be cast in American or Hispanic roles without ever having to conform to Hollywood's cultural stereotypes. His screen presence is undeniable, and as of late, he's been leaving his imprint in shows such as Amazon's Alpha House, USA's The Queen of the South, and now Fox's new drama, Pitch, arguably his biggest role to date. To discuss this and more, Mark joins me now on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. First of all, we're here at the uh, Live with Kelly studios yep. at ABC, and Mark Consuelos just finished co-hosting uh, the show. Um, how does it feel like to be out there sitting in that seat? Yeah. Uh, I imagine it must be like nerve-wracking. Um, I get a little, well, you know, I'm a little claustrophobic, so I do start to see the walls come in just a few <laughs> times they have like started moving on me, but it, I mean... I, Listen, I, I'm. It's hard to be objective, you know, because I'm married to her, but I, she's amazing. My wife. Right. I mean, I get to. You know that you're gonna have. You're gonna be safe. You're gonna have a great time. She won't let you fail. Uh, she makes you look good. She's my wife. So yeah. She, so she it's takes so care. it's easier. But totally do you have take... to rehearse. I, I mean, a lot of what you do is the amplification of your personality. You have to be the most likable man in America at that point, right? <laughs> well. Um, I never thought about it that way, but that's probably a good thing to think about. I think that, you know, I used to, you know, we, sometimes I, I think about a few things that I want to talk about because it'll be funny. Uh, it's something that just, that I, that occurs to me as, as funny. Um, or, you know, Michael Gelman will come in with a few items that I think will be really funny to our relationship that, that right. just pertain to us. And I, we have a fun spin to it. And I think that's, what's interesting with us is that, you know, a few times a year we, we get, we kind of have like, like you said, an amplified version or discussions that we have as a married couple that sometimes a lot of married couples have. But it's funny. I mean, we've had we've had some crazy conversations. You know, we had the, um, what do you think is the appropriate age if God forbid something happened to one of us and you had to move on? Like, Oof, like right, you know, right, right? Like right. we had like a lot of like. So, how old would your like next wife have to be? Oh my god! Like, we had that conversation on live TV. On live TV, and we did it, and it was hilarious wow. because I think. A lot of married couples have had that silly, you know, conversation at a dinner party. Like, all right, so what's right. appropriate? <laughs> and, and, you know, so we, we've done some crazy stuff. Well, congratulations, man. Thanks, you man. make it look easy. Uh, and also congratulations on the new show. Thanks, Ben. Pitch on Fox. Um, I got a, I had a chance to see it. And I have to say, I really enjoyed this show. I Thank love you. the concept. I think yeah. it's very well executed. And I happen to think it's going to be one of the big hits of the fall TV. I, I, I really do hope so. Um, you know, the exciting part of it is that for the sports fan, for the pure sports fan, uh, baseball fan, and female and male, because we have a lot of female sports uh, baseball fans out there that I'm realizing it's not just a male-dominated thing. I mean, not anymore. A yeah. lot of hardcore female baseball fans. For them, it's... We're partners with MLB, with Major League Baseball. So we get to use all the logos, all the stadiums. And when I was growing up and watching a, you know, the TV show that took place in a professional sports team, you'd kind of be taken out of it because they would have a fictional team because they didn't have licensing. So it'd be like the St. Louis, you know, Bobcats, or it'd be weird. And you're like, all right, well, that's not really Major League Baseball or football, or whatever it is. MLB is our partner in this with wow, Fox. Yeah. So they've given us full access. Full access, and um, it's never happened before. 
So I'm excited about that. Also, as a, a father of a 15-year-old daughter and just some of the messages that you see in this pilot, and it's not too preachy, but, you know, about empowerment and, and, and uh, overcoming adversity and equality and gender equality and all the things that, and inequality, right. all the things that come with stepping into a man's world or, you know, which has been dominated by men. And you see this young, uh, this young pitcher uh, played by um, uh, Kylie Bunbury, who's amazing. Amazing. She's amazing. Amazing. Um, she's such a star. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm excited about it. I mean, I, I, like I said on Kelly's show, I've, you know, I've been lucky enough to do some really cool projects for the past few years. I think as I've gotten older, the opportunities of Queen of the very, South was yeah, one of them. Yeah, Queen of the South, American Horror Just Story. Just got renewed. Yeah, Alpha House, um, you know, Kingdom on DirecTV. I mean, some really cool shows. Each one of them different, um, but this one to me, just as as a father of a fifteen year old daughter, is, I think is is I'm I'm really proud of this one. Now you play uh, Oscar Arguella, yeah, who's the I general like how manager. You say it. Oh, well, you know, thank you, <laughs> Oscar Arguella. Oscar Arguella, and yeah. you're the general manager for the San Diego Padres. And what I really like about the show is that it's one of the rare shows that takes a Hispanic actor, a Hispanic character as well, yeah. and puts him as a successful. A professional, which sure. is something that we don't see quite often. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your character. <clears throat> He's um, Oscar is a former ball player. wasn't very good. He was like a journeyman, you know, kind of like a utility guy. Right. Didn't hit for average, but he made it to the big leagues. Grew up in Mexico, poor, and made it in. And um, his manager, you'll find out during during that time, was his manager now. Hmm. So they've kept that relationship together, and he fights for him. And you, you don't know if he's a big fan, but you know that there's a bond there that no one can, no one can can break. And what I do like about it is that you know he's up, up, he's absolutely working in a world that just just like Ginny is. I mean, there's not a lot of Hispanic GMs. No, not at all. Um, uh, you know, um, Manaya was one for the for for the for the Mets a few years back. But I agree with you um, that you learn you learn about Oscar that he's accomplished. That he has overcome adversity, um, that he has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder because of it, right? And uh, he's a baller. I mean, he's <laughs> like he makes no excuses um, for he, you know the general manager. Also, I learned is that he, he, he either as a player you either really like your general manager or you can't stand him because he's going to trade you and you know he doesn't like you and you're just there. So he has that kind of strange relationship with the team, right. which I love. Um, and he knows he's not well liked, but doesn't really care. He's got a job to do because at the end of the day, being liked is, is, is okay. It's nice. But if you don't win, right. someone else is going to be there taking my job. So that's, to me, that's, that's first and foremost. Now, tell me a little bit about your Hispanic heritage. Um, yeah. I, I feel like it's not talked about enough. You know, I, yeah. think, I think one of the great, special, unique things about you, Mark, is that you have the ability in Hollywood to play an American character and yep. not miss a beat, and then play a Hispanic character and also not miss a beat. That's a very unique thing, which I'm sure that keeps you consistently working. Yeah, um, I I was born in Spain. Um, uh, my dad's Mexican, and my mom's Italian. Uh, he met my mom in Italy. He was a U.S. citizen working in Italy, and they met, and we went to Spain when they had me. So I, I'm not really Spanish other than I was born in Spain. Right. But yeah, my dad's you know from Mexico City. Uh, came here when he was in his early teens as a middle school kid and, uh, you know, made a life of it and, right. and, and you know, served in the Navy and, um, you know, worked for the Department of Defense with Special Operations Command. So he's a, he's a real, he's a real example of the success of immigration. Now, do you feel Hispanic or do you feel like you're an American? Um, I feel American, absolutely American. I'm very proud of my Hispanic heritage. I'm very proud of my Italian heritage. Um, you know, I lived in Italy for the first uh, five years of my life. And so Italian is my first language. Get out of so, here. So, yeah. So I feel like, you know, maybe not by design, just by happenstance that, you know, I don't really have an accent. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. Um, you know, my dad, you know, was, you know, he kind of really acclimated us to the American life right away. You're Americans. Right. This is what you're going to do. Um, and I don't know, I think it's right now, it's absolutely a blessing because the jobs like to your point, um, that have come up have been really interesting ones for me. I get to play, you know, some pretty accomplished, play a lawyer on Queen of the South. I play a general manager now of, 
of um, you know the Padres, and you're a is, politician in Alpha House, and, and politi- I mean, senator. Yeah, you're yeah. getting all the accomplished. Uh, yeah, Hispanic it's cool. Jobs. No, <laughs> I, I never thought of it that way. It's 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 been it's been really gratifying, you know. And by the way, listen, I, I'm not going to wake up and go play a gang member because I just don't have that vibe anyway. Right. But if you you know listen, if you gave me enough time and I shave my head and get my facial hair, <laughs> put some probably, tattoos, put some tattoos beard. on my neck, you know, I could do that too. But no, I'm 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 really proud of of the stuff the opportunities that have been given to me and, and have had to fight for recently. It's well, good. you have great momentum going on. And so before I let you go, yeah, I want to do a quick uh, little speed round with you. Sure, man. Kind of just to get to know you a little bit better. Favorite late night show? Um, Jimmy Kimmel. App you can't live without? Um, Waze. <laughs> nice. Okay. Funniest person you've ever met? Kelly Ripa. A movie that changed your life? Um, Kramer versus Kramer. That's a good one. Yep. And finally, an album you'd recommend to everyone. Oh my gosh, um, my daughter is, is a re- no one really knows. She's a singer, and whatever her first album is going to be, nice. that's the one I'll recommend. <laughs> You're like the perfect guy. I'm <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you so much, Mark Consuelos, for being on the podcast. Thank you. You can catch Mark Consuelos on Fox's Pitch every Thursday night at 9 p.m. It's time for Jacked In, where we plug ourselves in to recap the most highly relevant bicultural pop culture news that happened this week. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Let's begin with the top movie news of the week. Hollywood is remaking the 1952 Academy Award winning Western High Noon, which will be set in the present day along the cartel controlled U.S. Mexico border. Mr. Fifty Shades of Grey, Jamie Dornan, joins Robin Hood Origins. Jared Leto will play Andy Warhol in a new biopic. And what has to go down is one of the worst ways to find out your best friend got divorced. George Clooney was blindsided when a CNN reporter told him that Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie were divorcing, all while he was attending. President Obama's United Nations Roundtable on the Refugee Crisis. Have a listen. All right, don't shoot me on this last question. It's a big story. You're, you're friends with both of them. Your thoughts, any thoughts? She's a humanitarian. Uh, a win on Angelina and your friend Brad. Oh, uh, what, what happened? They are divorced. I didn't know that. Wow. She that's, filed. Uh, I feel very sorry. Then uh, that's, that's a sad story. And unfortunate for a family. Uh, it's an unfortunate story about... Uh, Changing over to the small screen, the primetime Emmys hit an all-time low rating, which means you probably didn't watch it. So here's a quick recap. Game of Thrones is the best drama on TV. The best comedy was HBO's Veep. And in a win no one expected, Mr. Robot's Rami Malek won Best Actor in a Drama Series. ABC is readying a Magnum P.I. sequel. Netflix wants 50% of their library to be original programming within a few years. Mariah Carey made a cameo on Empire, and Trevor Noah will host the MTV Africa Music Awards. Switching to music, Beyonce and Jay-Z are planning a charity show in New York called Title X 1015 in support of the Robin Hood Foundation. Other musical guests will include Nicki Minaj, Common, Lauren Hill, and DNCE. According to Nielsen, 41 million Latinos listen to radio each week. And the Latin Grammy nominations were announced this week. Mexican duo Jesse E. Joy, Fonseca, each received four nominations, and Spanish singer Pablo Alboran received three nods, including Best Album and Record of the Year. In tech and social media news, welcome to the future. The U.S. government officially endorsed this week self-driving cars. ABC News teams up with Facebook to livestream the 2016 general election debates, and Google debuted Allo this week, a new smart messenger app that learns from your conversations and suggests things for you to say. But interestingly enough, Edward Snowden said, whatever you do, do not use it. And we'll finish off with Broadway. World War II era musicals plan to come to life on the Intrepid Museum January 2017. On your feet, Ana Villafaña received the National Hispanic Foundation for the Arts' Horizon Award at their 20th annual Noche de Gala. And playwright Edward Albee, one of the foremost playwrights of his generation, passed away at age 88. If you watch the hit TV show Jane the Virgin, then you'll recognize the voice that opens almost every episode. Have a listen. When Jane Gloriana Villanueva was a young girl, there was one story she loved to be told over and over again. His name is Anthony Mendez, a two-time Emmy-nominated voice narrator who happens to be Dominicano. 
I caught up with Mendez after the primetime Emmys to talk about the lack of Latino inclusion at this year's Emmys, why we need more original Latino stories in films, and details on the new TV pilot he's working on. Anthony, thanks a lot for joining me on the podcast. Hey, my pleasure, man. So I have to ask you, how does it feel to be nominated to an Emmy for a second year in a row? It's weird, right? It seems like the biggest pressure was the first time. You know, it's like uh, we were super excited. I even have a video of my wife jumping up and down. I decided to record it, um, and I'm glad I did. And the whole family was just ecstatic. This time, it was almost like, let's see if they, if it was just, you know, if it was just luck and we won again. So it was almost like... Like a fluke, like a fluke, yeah. Yeah, the first time it felt like, you know, we were very, very super lucky. And then the second time it felt like when we were nominated, we were relieved that we were. You know, because it would have felt like we were on the way down already. <laughs> That's so crazy. You know, the first thing I, 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 I think of is when you got nominated is, and, and I'm just being like honest here. Yep. It's Gina Rodriguez, the star of the show, the, the it girl of the moment wasn't nominated. Yeah, man. But you were. Does that create any resentment within the cast? It's like, wow, man, this guy's being recognized for his work, but none of us are. I don't I don't feel that from them. If it does, they definitely don't express that towards me, man. They, if anything, I've gotten a lot of love and support uh, via email, via text, via, via social media, and when I see them in person and when I connect with them on Skype, I don't really get that. I do get the disappointment in the show not being recognized, at least Gina. At least you know Gina. I mean? And I know Jaime Camille himself. Yeah, and I know Jaime Camille himself is, is, is seemed, when I saw him uh, when he was doing Chicago here, he seemed more disappointed for Gina not getting it than him himself not getting it. So they're they're kind of like that. They're very it's 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 just weird, but they they are so selfless, you know, and they really do kind of bond together and they bring people into the fold. So I don't think it created a resentment. I think the biggest thing is for people to understand that it's a different process for the creative arts uh Emmys uh, sp- particularly narration than for the other performers that are on camera. Yeah, can you explain can you explain a little bit about the Creative Arts Emmy? So it's a precursor to the actual Emmys that happen on Sunday night. Uh, and it's like a whole event. You, I imagine you had to fly out to L.A. You had to be there. How was that whole process like? The process begins pretty much the same as it's all considered the primetime Emmys, right? Because your show has to be on primetime. It has to be... Uh, had, has to have had broadcast within a certain time frame as well uh, and, and certain term or certain season. Uh, part of the year anyway. Um, so it's all considered primetime Emmys, but obviously the Creative Arts Emmys is more behind-the-scenes type work, uh, outside of the guest actors, of course, which they kind of throw into our category as well. Um, so it, it's it's you basically decide, okay, you know what, let's grab uh, an episode to submit, for narration anyway, and let's submit it, and... Uh, Let's say 10 minutes. They want us to do 10 minutes of our work, and we submit that, and then we just kind of sit and wait, man. And with narration, unlike on-camera performers, we're not allowed to campaign. So there's no four-year consideration campaign allowed for narrators. We're not allowed to do that because it's an internal body that votes, an internal body of your peers that votes. So they all are required to watch the work that's submitted in order to vote both in the first round for nominations and in the second round for winners. Um, So it's very, very different, man. So in that case, I think that that could also explain part of the reason why maybe some of the cast, uh, nobody else got nominated. nominated. I don't know. Um, All I know is it's just a very different process. Uh, And when I get nominated, the only disappointment I have is the fact that you won't see promos touting the show as an Emmy-nominated show. Yeah. Uh, just when the, just because a narrator got nominated, but it's part of it. It's part of the way it is, and you embrace it. But in my heart, I always say that you know that it is everybody's win. It's the writers' win. It's Jenny Ehrman's win. It's the show's win, and it's the cast. You're representing the show, right? Without the cast, the narrator would be some crazy dude. Yeah, I'm representing the show, so that's how I see it. I just wish that we could have brought the hardware home this time, but we'll try again next year. Hopefully. You know, fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. Look, thank God we have a third season to do that. That's so. awesome. Congratulations on that. Now, here's the big question: How many other Latinos were there? It's hard to it's hard to tell a hundred percent, obviously, because we all look so, so vastly different, right? I don't. I didn't see enough Latinos here, but I did see 
several African Americans, which you know gives me hope that maybe our turn is next. We'll see. I mean, it's just it's tough, man. I read something today. Um, can't remember where it was, but it says that there were only two Latino actors uh, nominated, and I was one of them. Um, and uh, none that won. And that, to me, as much as we tout um, diversity, unless it's all inclusive, we really aren't there yet, man. Where is your place in this, man? I mean, what's, what stance are you taking about this? Is this something that bothers you? Is it something that you just go, you know what? I'm over it. I just want to get paid. I want to do my job, come back home to my family. I don't care about this subject or conversation. We live with it, man. I mean... Any person of color can tell you we live with this. It's not just about the lack of inclusion in Hollywood. It's about the lack of inclusion in life. So we kind of live with it. So um, I wouldn't say that it bothers me so much as I am fully aware of it and hypersensitive to it. Um, and I don't mean emotionally. I just mean that I'm, I have that radar and I can kind of detect when people treat you certain a certain way. Um, so it's it's not something that, you know, I... I'm I'm more of a uh, undercover activist, if you will, because I understand the dynamics. I understand that we need more Latinos on the other side of the glass. I understand, um, uh, you know, structural inequality. Uh, I understand a lot of things that happen in this country in terms of redistricting um, and things like that. But I just want to create my own stuff, man. And and it's what I encourage people to do. You know, I want to create my own things, and I cannot allow excuses. And what I mean by that is not that we don't have legitimate reason to be upset, but I, what I mean by excuses is uh, examples like, oh, I'm not a writer. I shouldn't write my own stuff. No, you know what? Put pen to paper and that's how you start. Every writer um, wrote their first piece, you know, and that's how you kind of start getting into it. So if you don't take that first step to try to create your own, your own, uh, your own stories and try to tell your own stories, um, it's never going to happen. And you can't, you can't let doubt creep in. You know, because there's so many opportunities now to do it. You can do YouTube. You can do Vimeo. Nobody says that you have to have a TV pilot that, get pitched, that gets picked up by one of the major networks. Now you have a, a slew of over-the-top uh, digital streamers. Um, you have Vimeo where you can put it up there. And if you want, you can even charge for it. Now you have YouTube. Um, for God's sakes, you have FTPs that you can just send it out to every, anybody you want. So to create your own work is just, uh, it's more feasible now. Um, and I think that, we need those stories out there, man. So at least put pen to paper and start creating stories because we, part of the issue of not being included is who's writing these stories. We tend as human beings to write what we know. And as we, and if you're someone who grew up with no friends of color or didn't interact with anybody or didn't get close enough to anybody who's a person of color, then you're going to write like that. That's that's Woody Allen's whole issue. One day I uh, I was interviewing Woody Allen and, yeah. and I straight up asked him, I think it was the first time anyone had ever asked him, why is it that this that you're considered a New York director who does New York films, yet whenever anybody of color looks at your movies, it's all white people. Like nobody of color exists in New York City in your movies. And that is what's being propagated yeah. across the world. That, oh, by the way, there's no black people, there's no Latinos in your movies. Therefore, it's when you go, ever you go to New York, it's just a bunch of you know white people. And I had an issue with that, so I asked yeah. him, and he goes, "You know what it is, Jack? It's just I don't know that many people of color, so I write what I know." It was just a really interesting perspective. It really is, man. And if you can put us, you know, there's reason to stand up, you know for it, for inclusion and diversity. There's reason for it, obviously. We need it. But um, you you got to remove the anger out of it a little bit. Um, if you can start to begin to look at why does this happen, then you can start to get a little bit more uh, ideas, some more ideas about how to bring a solution to that problem. And I firmly believe that it's a lot of it is creating our own stuff, man, just creating our own work. If, if the work is good, um, the story is good, and it's unfortunate, but we have to be twice as good as the general market. Um, like one of the things that bothers me the most is sometimes you see these independent films, they, you know, these coming of age films about two, um, let's say, millennials, for lack of a better term. And they're, you know, this it's pretty nonchalant kind of mundane day to day stuff. And, and it's a love story or it's a story about them trying to find a job or just smoking weed all day or whatever <laughs> it is. You're right. Latinos can't really write stories like that. We have our stories have to be twice as good and until it gets to that point where we can just write 
you know, a stoner movie. The last one that I remember was uh, that was Latino was uh, Cheech and Chong. Yeah, and they, they weren't necessarily well made. But how many other, you know, um, stoner dude movies do you see since then? Not many. I, I mean, I'd love to see Latinos do romantic comedies. I'd love to see that perspective. You know, maybe interracial comedies between a black woman and a Latino woman or a white woman and a... Latino person. I mean, I think what filmmakers should be focusing on, the type of stories they should be really writing, are not immigration yes. stories, uh, cartel stories, gang warfares. I-, I think we should kind of expand about that. I understand that that's a- the reality of a lot of our Hispanic community, but th- that's not yes. everyone's. That- that's yeah, not mine. That's right. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of us that 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 have lived an American lifestyle that doesn't necessarily propagate those things. That's why I have a problem with, with it seems like there has to be a reason for it to be Latino, you know, and it just can't be because it's an American story. You know, it feels like there always has to be a reason for it to be Latino. Right. Otherwise, it's not, you know, it can't just be an American story. It's unfortunate, but it, feel, it what upsets me, I'll, I'll give you an example in the trailer world, for example, um, where I do some movie trailers and stuff like that for a long time. You know, half the movie trailers I do, if not a large majority nowadays, are in Spanish. But my first language is English. You know, I was born here, you know. So I had to work on Spanish just as much as I had to work on English in order to be able to do voiceovers. And they wouldn't give me a shot at the general market stuff because I had what they considered an urban voice. So wait, they think you sound black? Yeah, they. it was one of the first things, the first jobs that I did were African-American roles or... Or <laughs> there's a fast food company, I'm not going to mention a name, who tends to hip hopify all their radio commercials. And I stopped auditioning for those because <laughs> of that. And, uh, and I remember those were the kind of things that I, that I ended up getting. Uh, Spanish and the urban stuff. That's it. No general market stuff. And the reasoning behind it, I was told, was because for general market uh, movies, they didn't want to isol- uh, uh, alienate the general market population, a.k.a. the white people. So... You know, they had to put a general market guy. But then when they had the urban movie, and I was like, okay, cool. Let me get a shot at this urban movie. You know, it's about hip-hop. It's about this. I can do that. Or at least Latino. They were like, oh, you know, we're, putting, we're going to put a general market guy in there to to let, to let again, not to alienate the general oh, market. Oh, my God. You know, so I'm like, so where the hell do I fit in, you know? So that was one of the challenges. So it's, it's and you know, and my point is, you know, the number one consumer of hip-hop are white people. But you don't see hip-hop artists. Uh, having to train to learn a standard American English, the so-called standard American English, which is an actual term in the voiceover business. You don't see them doing that. People are going to connect with story, man. People are going to connect with truth. When somebody's going to tell the truth about something uh, or pour their heart into something, uh, tell a good story, a human story, people are going to connect with that, man. They're not really as as concerned as people think with, with, uh, with accents. Of course, to a certain degree, um, some accents can be seen as jarring. And so I understand the marketing perspective, but there has to, again, we have to be the ones on the other side of the glass creating the work so that we can, um, I'll give you an exa- another example. There's a trend right now for voiceovers, which is the conversational read, the, and you hear a lot of the guttural fry, kind of like the, the dude on the couch. Kind of <laughs> and it's because a lot of people that are creating the work, that's what they sound like. So they hire voice actors that kind of, sound like them unless again there's a reason there's a theme there's a concept that would force them to kind of go outside of that you don't know how many auditions i turned down man where i got to do the uh the barry white thing. oh my god i I could totally see see you doing that though oh man let me tell you i I used to do them but now i turn them down because i'm just like you know what man give me a shot at this stuff just for what it is not because it's a high concept or it's a concept thing now that doesn't mean that there are certain works that are worth you know reading obviously jane the virgin was one of them but generally you kind of have to watch out for that and the 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 flip side of that is that it takes longer to build a career that way because you're kind of picking and choosing a little bit but at least i can sleep at night man and that's the important thing at the end of the day anthony uh but listen changing gears quickly um you have a lot of projects on the table man uh you got the third season of jane the virgin coming up but uh also elena of avalor on disney Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a huge deal. First of all, because it's the first Latina princess that Disney actually puts out. Finally. 2016, yes. and they're just doing this, yes. which I still have a problem with that. But you know what? Better late than never. You're also moving to L.A., and we got to talk about that because yep. 
dude, you're 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 a you're a New York Jersey boy, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you're doing a project with Mike That's Mike right. Toom. Yeah. Yeah. So let's begin with Elena Vavilor. How did you how did you how did you end up getting that gig? And uh I'm sure you're proud of of working with that show. Oh, it was an amazing I mean, I was looking forward to that show and and I'm sure like every Latino actor and voice actor, um, when the rumors started flying about them developing that particular show, you know, they wanted to be a part of it. And I was lucky enough where Craig Gerber um knew my work from Jane the Virgin and he invited me to be on an episode. Um, and King Juan Ramon was the guy's name. He had, it's, it's, I always say he's very similar in terms of accent to the Latin lover narrator, but he's not as, as much of a metrosexual as the Latin lover narrator, <laughs> Latin lover narrator is. He's right. more, he is more, more pompous, more, more regal in, in, that, <laughs> in that regard. Um, but it was fun. It, it's, it's just to see that man. And, and you know what the, the funny thing is we do all these things, um, and you know, they are, Bottom line is, yes, it's work, right? But when you are given your first animation job and it happens to be Disney and you didn't have to audition for it, I mean... Oh, that must be so good, man. Oh, my God, it's amazing. And I'm hoping that, you know, I'm just hoping that Elena will visit uh, <laughs> Cordoba more, more yeah. often so that I can come back. But that was a lot of fun to do. And it was a lot of fun to see my kids react to it, too. So, so why are you moving to L.A., Anthony? I'm considering moving to L.A. for next year because, you know, it's at a point where there's a certain window right now where I can kind of take more meetings, be more active in the Television Academy. I joined the Television Academy um, last year uh, after my first nomination, and it's very hard to be active from New York, um, or as active anyway, from New York, from the East Coast. It's also very hard to take certain meetings, attend certain events, um, fundraising um, events, charity events, uh networking meetings, project meetings, pitch meetings, and things like that. It's just very, very difficult to do it right now. And I have a certain window because of the work that I'm doing right now to kind of leverage that, you know, and, and, and take advantage of that. So it's not, a, it's not, I never see anything as permanent. Everything, my voiceover coach, Maurice Tobias, always said, always add a for now at the end of it. So I'm moving to LA, hopefully uh, within a year's time, by next year, six to nine months is the time frame I'm giving myself. But it's for now. Let's see what happens. Let's let's be a little close to where the action is. Where and the the reality is that ninety percent of my income comes from California, even though I'm working from here in Jersey. That's interesting. So it's 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 a place to be for now. Plus, you can't beat the weather. I mean, come on. <laughs> no, it's perfect, dude. You don't have to deal with the winter here. So tell me about Mike Toom. Mike Toom took a has taken on a life of its own and and has kind of morphed into different things. The idea originally was to write. An autobiography. It's a comic uh, book, right? Life. It's a comic book. Yeah, it's a, it's a comic book that I plan to make it into a motion comic. My tomb started off as a screenplay that I wanted to convert into a graphic novel. Then it turned into the idea to separate it into several issues. Um, now, what we're working on is is rewriting it uh, because there's so many elements, right, to the story. We rewriting it into a TV pilot, creating an audio book performance, almost like a table read out of the. TV pilot so I can release it on Audible to try to spread the story that way instead of just kind of emailing or sending around a script, you know? So that's the, that's where we are right now with it. That's great, man. I, I, I'm a huge fan of comic books. And I think one of the big issues is not so much that there's no talent, no Hispanic talent in comic books. Actually, if you, if you ask around the comic book industry who the best drawers, editors are, so forth. Oh, yeah. Yo, they're, they're, they're Latinos, Latinos, man. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But the yeah. problem they're, they're is, the best artists are, are Latino. yeah, but the problem is Hispanic stories. That's yes. the issue. And so having one it's, like yours, which is kind of based on your life, those are the yeah. type of stories yeah. we need. Yeah, it's one of the things that I learned from, from the writers of Jane is, is to ground everything in reality. And, and instead of making some sort of supernatural kind of uh, over-the-top patriotic dude that is on-the-nose Dominican or what have you, I just wanted to tell a story about a young Dominican kid um, and intertwine it with, you know, with the supernatural um, and religion and maybe a little bit of politics. I wanted to do all of those things. So I think that's why uh, we decided uh, for, to change it into a TV pilot, because for like for a full screenplay for a movie, you have to tie up a lot of loose ends. And there's so many things happening here that I kind of want to give myself room to 
you know, to develop some of those side stories and other and other uh, and other plots and things like that. Before I let you go, I'm just very curious at knowing this because I had interviewed you for NBC Latino, and I didn't get That's to right. ask you this. <laughs> All right. And so I'm interviewing you now, and I'm like, you know what? I forgot to ask him this, but. Whenever you go out, like to dinner, to the supermarket, screw it, to the gym, because I know you're going to the gym now, uh, yeah. and you speak, is anybody recognizing your voice at this point? Well, at the gym, I go to a CrossFit gym, and we call it the box. At the box, everybody knows what I do, for the most part. Oh, see, but they know. It. They know about you already. Yeah, they kind of know, yeah. But when it comes to, to being out and about, I, I, people look at me, or, or I, I can feel people turn their heads when I speak. Um, I I can't really put my finger on it, but there's obviously something unique about my voice, right? Um, That kind of attracts people to to it. Um, And I think that also helps with storytelling. But there are some people, um, there was one guy, I happened to have a a Jane the Virgin uh, battery pack, like one of those mobile packs that you do so your cell phone doesn't die. Right, right. That was an IHOP (laughs) charging my phone with that. You know, the executive producers gave that to me one year as a gift. And uh, it was super cool, a Mofi. And I had it there charging my phone. One of the servers walks by. I said, I love that show. And then my wife, of course. Oh, you know, he's the narrator. I was like, oh, man. So we all took pictures. So that's kind of cool. But I, I, but people have no idea because, you know, I do so many different kinds of things. I don't walk around. There's a good interview with Don LaFontaine, um, if you look it up. And people ask him, do people recognize your voice? And he says that he doesn't walk around talking as if he's doing movie trailers. So I don't walk around talking as if I'm doing narration or things. So I don't think people recognize it right off the bat. No, Jenny does. Jenny Ehrman, uh, Jenny Snyder Ehrman, the creator of the show, she can pick me off from anything, no matter what kind of character I put That's on. That's hilarious. But most, yeah, but most people won't. Yeah, most people will not. Well, listen, man, I wish you the best. I'm going to miss you because I know that I could have just gone across the bridge and, and hang out with you. Dude, we got to oh, hang before I move. I, I, I have a feeling this is... It's going to get better for you. I wish you the best luck with the comic book and, and the show and uh, everything else, man. Thanks a lot, Jack. I appreciate your support, man, and the love from the very beginning, brother. I really appreciate it. You can catch Anthony Mendes as the voice of the Latin lover in the premiere of Season 3 of Jane the Virgin, Monday, October 17th at 9 p.m. A lot of new TV shows premiered this week, including NBC's well-received This Is Us, ABC's Notorious, CBS's MacGyver, and Fox's The Exorcist. But there's one show I actually enjoyed the most out of the lot, Fox's new drama, Pitch. Frank and I have been talking now. Have you now? We can't send her down. You've got to be kidding me. You're laying down on this just to sell a few extra tickets? Now, it's more than a few extra tickets, Al, and you know that. But that's not what this is about, and you know that, too. It's one thing to be the team that called up the first woman. It's another thing to be the team that picked the wrong woman and turned this whole thing into a disaster. This fictionalized show about the first female to ever play Major League Baseball is intriguing, well-crafted, and surprisingly, not fluffy. Co-star Mark Paul Gossler, mostly known for playing Zack in the classic Save by the Bell series, explains why it's not just a typical sports drama. For me, reading it, it was a story that I just couldn't put down. Put down. It was, it's, it's, it's like a, a good movie, a good book. It's just one of those things that you, you think about after. Uh, it has an impact on you. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the stories of, of struggle, I think, that as human beings we can all... Um, relate to the Ginny character, Ginny Baker, and we could relate to uh, what she's going through. Starring the magnetic Kylie Burberry in the lead role and clearly based on the life of Little League female pitcher Monet Davis, the show explores themes of gender and race discrimination, the pressures of the public limelight, and an incredible access never seen before for Major League Baseball. The production quality is bar none, and I won't lie, I was caught up in the hype of its premise. Pitch is a show that delivers, and though there may not be any A-list stars, it doesn't really need it. The story and the journey of this young woman is all you need. One of the biggest problems facing American mainstream journalism today is the visible lack of minorities in their newsrooms. To discuss this serious issue with me is Tanzina Vega, one of the most accomplished Latina journalists in America. NPR's Code Switch listed her in their Journalists of Color to Watch in 2014 list and one of the top 40 Latinos in American media by the Huffington Post. 
She worked for the New York Times for almost a decade and was the first journalist there to create a national beat on race and ethnicity. She's now a digital correspondent for CNN for Race and Inequality and joins me now on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. Um, I was just remembering the first time I saw you and I met you was at a New York Times event for Viva Broadway. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. You were moderating. With Lin-Manuel. With Lin-Manuel Miranda. No one ever thought that Lin-Manuel was creating one of the greatest masterpieces in art, period. First of all, if we can go back to that day, if I had known that, I would have gotten tickets then. (laughs) Because I feel like at some point I need to use my Puerto Rican pass <laughs> and get in you know what i mean because i'm like i still Boricua. i still i'm ready to follow him to chicago I, I i feel like i've missed a critical moment of our culture but i am so excited like you said you would have never thought then i mean we knew he was great right right but thinking about then and then i remember the day he was nominated for all those tony awards I think one of the most Tony Awards that anyone's yeah, it was like ever a been. Yeah, it was like along a, with the producers, I think it was fourteen. Yeah, it was some. It was, it was some astronomical number. And I remember I was going to recover, uh, cover an event, and I tweeted that the importance of what that means, right, to a lot of young Puerto Ricans, young Latinos, young Brown children today. I, you know, we we didn't have that, or if we had it, we didn't. I don't know if we knew as many of the you know, prominent Puerto Ricans and Latinos that were out there. But what is that, what message that sends, you know, to young brown children and black children and white children that this is possible, that you can do this and that this is somebody that comes from the same community that you come from, that this is somebody who is now, you know, probably the most popular, famous, sought after, you know, playwright and theater genius that we have, who's who happens to be Boricua. So I never knew. I mean, I knew he was great, but the 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 Not depths, the depths, amazing of excellence. You know, and he's two for two because, you know, interestingly enough, everybody talks about how incredible um, Hamilton was, but I actually connected more within the Heights. Me too, because I felt that that was the story of my life. That's right, mine, mine too. Yep. And so when I saw Hamilton, I gave it all the admiration that it deserves. Uh, but emotionally, from a childhood perspective, from a Latin bilingual perspective, to see us represented in the highest levels on Broadway, which is the Great White Way, that's when you know that he had tapped into something. The ability to change the landscape of a particular industry like Broadway is something that needs to be respected. And so with Hamilton... He changed the game again. Now, talking about diversity, this is something that you're very passionate about. How did you get so fervent about race and ethnicity in your particular uh, profession? Well, I think, first of all, you know, I was born Latina. I was born working class um, and a woman. So those three things about who I am definitely shape my reality. And I um, was able to, quote unquote, get out of the projects, right, and spent um, you know, my, my formative years sort of, you know, making sure that that was something that, that I was going to do, but that reality comes with me wherever I go. And when you move, quote unquote, move up the ladder and end up in more mainstream spaces, you know, white, whiter spaces, you know, more elite environments like the New York times, like, you know, even CNN to a certain extent, you know, you begin to realize that there are differences and that the game is not always the same for everybody, right? And and then you had pitched it, right, mm-hmm. at the well, Times? I pitched, so I pitched the beat to the Times. To Jill Abramson. To Jill actually. Abramson. Um, and I started carving out this, like, little side beat in culture that looked at the intersection of race and, and, and media. And it was like suddenly all of, because I was paying attention to conversations that other people weren't paying attention to. So that whole Nina Simone, Zoe Saldana issue yeah that started 2012 2011 like back then and i i noticed that and i said okay we have a, a, an issue here about colorism let's write about it big you know front page of the uh, culture section at the times they did this big story with all these photos of nina simone and really brought up the issue of colorism in a way that hadn't been talked about in the paper in quite some time eva longoria you know with her devious maids um show and the and the controversy that that you know sort of spurred um again hey, guys, this is happening. You know, we should talk about this. So I end up, you know, on a plane and in Hollywood meeting with um, with Eva 
and talking to her about that and her political ambitions as well or, you know, her political affiliations. So little by little, I began carving this out. And what I noticed was, and again, this is 2013, that there was a great reaction to these stories, but the Times wasn't covering race in any systemic way. And so I went to Jill Abramson after three years as a media reporter and I said, look, I have an idea. I have, you know, usually at that time, that beat, it was also like an entry beat. So after about two or three years, they're ready to change you to something else anyway. It's like in the agency world, you start off in the mailroom to a certain extent and then you work your way up. So this was the equivalent, up. right? Well, well, I had even started lower. I was a clerk and then I was a stringer and then, you know, I was a freelancer for, for Metro and then I was a web producer and I worked nights, weekends. So you want to go back to the mailroom. Right. I was so one you... step above that. So at this point, I was already three years in as a, as a staff reporter and I sort of, you know, created this beat, came up with this idea and said, Jill, you know, this is a lot of people are calling this the browning of America. And I think we need to really focus on this as, a, as an idea, as a topic. And this is pre-Ferguson again. So I think that's important to note, right? The quote unquote national conversation on race hadn't happened. The right? hypersensitivity aspects weren't there yet. No, this was pre-Black Lives Matter, all of that. And so she said, you know what? You're right. We should do this. Let's make it a national beat. That way you can sort of travel the country and find the stories. Um, and that's what I did. So the stories that I started writing about ranged from Asian Americans and elder care, black women and, and infertility, and then Ferguson happened. And the world changed, yeah. The world changed. And I was on the ground in Ferguson um, for eight days. And I was talking to everyone there from Al Sharpton to Jesse Jackson to the Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam, right? And I think... Being a woman of color, and I know that that mattered because when I met with the Nation of Islam and the Black Panthers, the new Black Panthers at a mosque in Ferguson, they pointed out the fact that I was a Puerto Rican woman. And they made that clear to the rest of the room. And I had never heard that before. And I think part of that was saying, this is a woman that gets it. She understands right. this. She, 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 you know, they asked me, where are you from and what's your whole back? So I told them, um, that level of access is important. And I think we don't give it that much credibility, but we should. In terms of why media diversity, our numbers are not great. And we keep seeing that the numbers are not great. And that was the frustration last summer when I wrote that piece you know, for CNN Money, but it was picked up by a bunch of other pieces and started that conversation on media diversity was because we've heard how bad the numbers are. Where's the change? Let's move on over to that because after you left the Times, uh, your new role here is race and ethnicity. How did those stories that you did at the Times, how do they change you as a person? Well, right now, the focus is also on inequality, financial inequality, economic inequality, right? And so I see that as being a little bit, at the Times, it was a broad area. Let's just write anything about race and ethnicity. So I was d dipping into everything from agriculture to healthcare, you know, um, to hashtags, to issues like microaggressions, right? And putting that stuff, I think I put black Twitter on the front page of the New York Times. I put microaggressions on the front page of the Times. And a lot of this type of work is often explaining these issues to newsrooms that often mm -hmm. don't understand it, right? Like people were saying, well, microaggression, what's that? Well, if you've never really experienced one, then yeah. it's hard to understand <laughs> what it is. But right. so I had to explain you it. You had to experience it, you right. Know? And, and it forces you to be able to say, you know, this is something I get and I understand. And as a woman of color, it's an, it, it, I've experienced this, but I'm explaining this to maybe a white male editor who's never, who's never heard of it, who doesn't understand it. So you're taking sometimes these esoteric com, you know, concepts <clears throat> and you're sort of forcing yourself to to be a better explainer of these things for your reader and for your newsroom. Right? I'm sure a lot of our people have an idea of what microaggression is, but maybe the term is probably new to them. Can you explain exactly microaggression? So microaggressions are what are known as sort of little slights. Maybe they're <laughs> indirect. Maybe they're not conscious. Little jabs at a party, at a cocktail. Things like, hey, Tanzina, where are you from? And I say, I'm from New York. And they go, where are you really from? Oh. Or your English is so good. <laughs> or, you know, you're really pretty for a... Puerto a Rican woman. girl. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, um, so those are some examples, I think. And they're very slight. <clears throat> they're very... Um, but they build up after a while. And, and they often are types of racism that I think people are either blind to or unconscious of or, you know, for example, they can also be class based. Like I grew up in, in public housing. Right. And if someone so if someone says to me, oh, you're so tough, you know, well, I might be. But 
that doesn't necessarily and and is that playing into some Latina stereotype that I'm or hot-headed. your urban background, urban and hot headed yeah. and angry and you know urban no. people are angry all, all the of time, them. all the time. <laughs> yeah, We're right? always angry <laughs> about everything. And you know what? We have some reason to be. I mean, that's the thing. Like we we have some reason to be. I mean, especially if we grew up in a certain community in certain decades. You know, New York wasn't what it is now. So, so. in journalism, you and I. Uh, basically were, have worked in New York in journalism. I used to work at Univision. As soon as I got out of that, when I went to VH1, started working, uh, doing appearances at the Today Show, the level of color started decreasing more and more and more. And so my question to you is, I know you've been writing about it. I know you've been very vocal and vociferous at times about it. But how do we solve it? I think we needed to do a bunch of things. I mean, I think what you're seeing now, there, there's a qualitative and a quantitative solution, right? The qualitative solution, and you're seeing this now with the federal government, where they're starting to collect data, for example, to understand why women and people of color are paid less, right? We know that this happens. We have the data. But now the federal government has said, we're going to start collecting data on all companies that have more than 100 employees, right, by race and gender, Now, of course, there's a big pushback to that, because ultimately, if we're able to find the data and solve the problem, then this is going to upset the power balance, right? So that's where you also need the qualitative aspect, which is political will to change, okay? And this, and it's not, there is no one turnkey solution for increasing, quote unquote, diversity or people of color or women or people with disabilities or the LGBT population within your newsroom. There is no one golden nugget. I think this has to be something where there's political will. I always argue, and, you, and you'll see this on, on my Twitter feed if you follow me and, and see that we have these conversations, I argue that we should not stop it at the entry-level jobs. I think a lot of organizations say, okay, we're going to go out and hire brown people, women, LGBT workers, you know, whatever, F- fill in whatever it is that you're Yeah, and they'll to be get. the clerk, they'll be the entry-level guy, right. you know, uh, getting my coffee, but you will never see management positions ever as long as I'm here. Correct. And so we need, and some people would say it's the pipeline, we need to create better pipelines. I think we need to create better relationships. It's not just about creating pipelines, right? It's about creating better relationships. And again, the political will like I've, I said this on, on a radio interview a couple months ago, if you have a room and there's four chairs in it and you want to change the composition of that room, someone in one of those chairs is probably going to have to move, right? And that is when we start getting to the higher levels of, of power. But those higher levels of power are necessary. We need diversity. And I know people hate that word, but we need it or inclusion or what have you, whatever you want to call it. We need to change and have newsrooms that are representative of the communities that they cover because you cannot continue to make and and we're seeing it with the news coverage today you know a lot of media is getting slammed for its you know quote unquote false equivalency right the fact that we're giving one candidate who's saying you know the Times said today as if it were news they said we're going to now call out Donald Trump's lies and I'm like that's your job (laughs) like that's not news but that's how low the bar has gotten right that now there's a big put oh yeah we're going to call out lies well that's your job You know what I mean? But maybe had these news organizations had, you know, different, you know, diversity among its ranks, maybe we would have approached this candidate a little differently. So here's my question then. If a white executive at a big media company doesn't hire a person of color in management, does that make them a racist? No, I don't think you can say that at all. I don't think you can say that at all. I think the question is... What are you, the the thing that we've always heard is we can't find them. We don't know where they are. Oh my God. That's like the favorite, favorite excuse. In the meantime, there's a million people raising their hands going, I'm right here. It doesn't make you a racist if you don't hire a person of color. And I think we need to eliminate that from the equation. I think what happens is we have unconscious biases and these implicit and unconscious biases are things that have been documented and they've been studied and they're emerging more and more in research today. And in fact, I'm doing quite a bit of work in that space. What happens often is in the hiring process, hiring managers are looking for a culture fit, which means they're looking for someone that looks like them. Or right? mimics them, or their mimics lifestyle, them. Their, the, the way school, they speak. Yeah. Where they went to school, what, how they speak, you know, where they came from, who they know. So if you do that, and that, and often that's an unconscious process, right? You're just sort of, oh, yeah, Ted and I, you know, went to the same school. Oh, that's great. We get you along. Know? We get along. He understands me. He gets me. Right. We speak the same language, right? 
So you're often going to defer to that person. Now, the other thing we've seen is that there have been studies that show that resumes with certain names get immediately tossed into the circle. What, like file. Rodriguez or something like, like that? Like Rodriguez, like Jamal, like, oh, you know, all of these that. names. Oh. Um, people who have criminal histories, right, potentially. See, but that's understandable, though. It might be, but it's also, well, at a certain point, we need to understand that if we don't reincorporate people into society, we're going to keep having these problems, right? And that's a, and that's a disproportionate um, effect on black and brown Americans because they have been the most highly incarcerated, you know, groups of Americans. So that's also something. That's why you see ban the box initiatives, you know, to get employers to start to stop talking about that. So wrong name, wrong school. I've talked to some folks who said, you know, depending on the companies, particularly in, in the tech industry, you didn't go to a top five, whatever. You're not they're not even going to look at your resume. So automatically off the bat, if you're middle class, you went to public school, uh, your last name is Rodriguez or Hernandez, you're not going to be at the highest echelons of the industry you want to work for right off the bat. I am a perfect example of that. I didn't go. I went to public school my whole life. I have a master's degree. I you went to CUNY. I went to CUNY for master's, SUNY for undergrad. Mostly because of an affordability issue. I could have done yeah. NYU. I could have done Columbia, but I would have been broke at this point. So, you know, I think, is it impossible? No. Is it difficult? And is it going to be more difficult for you? Absolutely. And another part of that is also the management structures and power structures. So what we see in media today, and I, we see it everywhere we go. We saw it a lot with digital media in particular when print sort of quote, quote unquote, print people started moving to digital power structures. And I tweeted this the other day, power structures replicate themselves. Yeah. So if you have a boss that goes from company A to company B, that boss is going to bring over their people. So now at company B, you have a very similar power structure to the one you had at company A. Good luck breaking that power structure. <laughs> right. Okay. So, you know, so, and, and, and you see something I want to, I do want to point out, um, Kevin Merida at on the undefeated, right? Kevin went and started his, this, this amazing, um, site, you know, about sports, the intersection of sports and race. And he exactly, he picked all of his people, but made a conscious, deliberate choice to say, I'm recruiting reporters of color, right? To make that happen. Fusion, I think has done the same thing. So it can be done. And it doesn't mean we can't hire white people. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about creating content that speaks to the audiences you're trying to reach and also breaking up these entrenched power structures that just seem to replicate themselves from company to company. If you're not moving with that power structure, you're not getting in. That's a very difficult thing to penetrate. Now, let me ask you, let's go to the on screen because that's the executive, the management issue. But I do, I have seen a problem with Latinos on camera. We are not existent on in front of the camera. So you look at all the morning shows, yep. right? CBS this morning, yep. not one Hispanic. Uh, you look at NBC, they had a Hispanic no longer. Um, you're looking at ABC, not one Hispanic. What is going on? Is it something against us or is it that we're not qualified enough? I mean, look, I, I do a lot of contribution on the Today Show, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily a full time gig. That's, you know, appearances here and there. But, uh, you know, even that, that's not even denting it. I've seen you on CNN, but that's not denting it. How? But I'm not a regular. Right. right? So, so we're looking that mm -hmm. there are no regulars, no, no, no Hispanics or Very of color. Uh, Very few. The, the numbers of Latinos in front of the camera, particularly in top media markets, are very few and far between. We have a couple here at CNN. But what I can say is that this has been an issue, particularly on the Sunday shows, right? Particularly when we're talking about, like, I see the conversations that are happening in, in this election cycle right now. Where are our voices? And again, what happens is we tend to say, okay, we've got, you know, three of the most well-known Latino journalists in the United Jorge States. Ramos, Jorge Ramos. Jose Diaz Balart. Maria Hinojosa, right? Let's say. Okay, that's great. These these are amazing journalists and these are amazing, amazingly talented people, but that is not the extent of our talent pool. There are so many Latinos out there who have this sort of bicultural experience, who have the gravitas, who have the the wherewithal, who can speak intelligently about what's happening. And not just about Latino issues. See, we're not a one 
issue group. And right. that's what I think happens. We get brought out to talk about immigration. immigration. And by the way, it's not even the number one topic anymore. It's not. They've so guess where we, we're right. not in the conversation. The but that, does Center, that mean right. I shouldn't be able to talk about the alt-right? Does that mean I don't have feelings about the alt-right movement that is this white supremacy movement that is now becoming part of the political discourse? Absolutely not. I am a Latina. And, you know, depending on what, you know, where I go, people assume I'm either Latina or Muslim, you know, so. You get the Muslim thing? Oh, I get I get Indian. You I get, get Indian. Indian, right. Yeah. So, you know, so we're like, <laughs> our, our identification we're multicultural, in the world, though. Very. We have a multicultural look. Like, you can't pin us down. And yeah. I think there was an but incredible. But they know we're not white. Well, did you hear about the Laurie Hernandez issue? Which one? There was an article in The Undefeated uh-huh. uh, about Laurie Hernandez, the Olympian. How. She was Puerto Rican or not Puerto Rican. Exactly. And, yeah. and there was like a huge mm-hmm. big debate on mm-hmm. identity. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that was said in the article was that I think a lot of people want to put Hispanics in a one size fits all category. That's correct. And the fact that we're so beautifully complex mm-hmm. and we come in so many varieties and sizes and, 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 and shapes that it creates a labeling category issue. And so they become a little crazy with it because are you black? Are you biracial? Are you Latino? I, I can't. And I don't want to ask the question because I might get sued. Right. So ultimately, why is this happening and how do we solve it? Um, I think it's happening because there's a lack of vision. I think, you know, there was a report in Harvard Business Review that talked about how managers often, a lot of diversity programs don't work because managers feel forced and no one wants to feel forced to do something. But at a certain point, you have to understand, and I think we saw this with the New York Times race beat. And for those who don't know, the Times killed the beat about a year into it when we were under new management. Um, I was reassigned to cover the Bronx courts and my readers were outraged. I was outraged. Thank you. Um, As were so many people. And I felt so humbled by that um, experience because readers pay attention and readers of color in particular, were the ones who said, wait a minute, we smell a rat. This isn't, this doesn't make sense. This, you're, you're, you're moving this person then to the Bronx? Like, you to know, know sort of a the weird... New York, the New York Times had said that the reason they canceled the beat was because every single writer should be talking about race at this moment because that's right. the time that we're living in. Mm-hmm. So we didn't need a specific one, but I disagree with that. Right. Well, obviously, so do they because they've reinstated, they've reinstated the it, beat yeah. um, and they reinstated the beat because they had to. They had no choice. Um, it was not only the sexiest beat of the decade, if I might add, but it was also the most necessary. Um, you can't get away from race right now. So to assume that every person is going to cover it is unfortunate and, and short sighted. And to be able to convey with the same experiences of people who had microaggressions or even macroaggressions to a certain extent, that does not come through in the writing. I wrote a story in 2013 about one of my first stories on that beat, and it was about Asian Americans and elder care. And I visited a community of Cambodians in the suburbs of Philadelphia in the middle of the winter. And this was an issue. It was cultural. It was similar to a lot of Latinos where we feel we have to take care of our elders But then there's this sort of American ethos where we may not all live together and we may not have the money to do that. And we don't, you know, so how do you take care of elders when you have a cultural responsibility? And for a lot of Asian Americans, particularly those who are not um, Chinese or Korean, um, where you might be able to have more access to people that speak those languages, right? Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean. If you're Cambodian, good luck trying to find a home health aide, you know, who understands what the food is, what the, the culture is, the language. And so I did this story, and to this day, I run into people at parties who say, thank God you did that story. Like, I'm not an Asian American woman, but I grew up in a community that was multi-ethnic and multiracial, Lower East Side. I have a comfort level with the, with, with, in, in, in just with, with being in a diverse environment, and I understand how to handle these, these issues with delicacy and with sensitivity, right? And so I think that's important. How do we solve it? I think we have to get over looking at diversity as this sort of ham-handed approach where it's let's just hire a bunch of people and not then not support them through the process, mm-hmm. right? We can't do that. That doesn't work. You know, you need to hire people who are diverse and not just diverse in one way. Another thing that happens a lot is we hire people who are diverse if they went to the same school. Oh, you went to Harvard? I went to Harvard. That's great. <laughs> that doesn't mean, okay, that's diversity on one level, <laughs> but we need, a, I'm just throwing this out there. How about socioeconomic diversity? How about, you know, geographic diversity? Right. How about, you know, 
uh, disability? You know, how about gender? I mean, all of these things matter. It's not just a question of getting, you know, enough, quote, you know, one box, checking one box and, and saying you're done. And then it's also a question I said of not just pipelines, but net relationship building. We have got to get better at relationship building. And without that, both sides of it, you know, from the right. bottom up and from the top down. Other, and there has to be political will to make that change. Changing gears. Uh, ¿Cómo está tu español? Bastante bien. ¿Lo hablas eh, en el trabajo? ¿Lo hablas en la casa? ¿Lo yo hablas lo hablo con tus cuando, amigos? Yo lo hablo cuando necesito hablarlo y me encanta hablarlo. Así te voy a decir cómo aprendí. Pues yo na nací en Nueva York. Boricua, New York, como quieren decir la gente. Pero Ajá. bueno, igual, yo hablaba Spanglish. <risa> entonces, ¿qué pasó? Es que, pero siempre lo hablaba cuando iba a Puerto Rico a visitar a mi familia y tal. Entonces, yo tenía como un don Ajá. para el español, pero no lo dominaba. Entonces, a los 25 años, decidí que me quería ir a España. Y me fui a España, me fui a Barcelona para vivir. Durante cuatro años me quedé ahí. Y ahí sí que aprendí un poco de catalán. Un poco hablar una mica de catalán, para los que hablan catalán. Uh. Um, y ahí sí que tenía un problema, o sea, que entendía bastante bien, hablaba normal, pero no, no podía tomar clases aún porque no era tan, 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 o sea, elemental. Entonces, para mí yo necesitaba una tutora y saqué una, 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 una profe que, se, que, que con ella... Así que aprendimos pues la gramática, la ortografía y todo eso. Y así que, así entonces viviendo, escribiendo, leyendo y, y, y viviendo el español, así es como me, 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 me puse con más fluidez. Pero lo hablas magnífico. Gracias. Now, it's interesting, there is this whole debate mm -hmm. on whether, what a real Latino is. Ooh, okay. <laughs> If you don't speak Spanish... Mm. And you only speak English, but your parents are from Latin America. You live in a Latin American household. Your mom still speaks uh, Latin uh, Spanish to you. You speak at home Spanish, but when you go out in the world professionally, you don't speak in, uh, Spanish normally. Then there's some Hispanics that say you're not really Latino. Where do you lie on this issue? I love the ability to speak Spanish. I absolutely love it. And I try to use it. And it's, her, it's helped me. I can't think of a place where it's hurt me, to be honest with you. It's helped me in my job. It's helped me in my reporting. It's something I felt personally passionate about wanting to really incorporate and make a part of my life for none other reason than I just love it. I love being able to talk to friends who speak Spanish. I love, you know, if I'm dating someone and they speak Spanish, that's great. You know what I mean? Oh, Because, the ability to listen to Spanish music, yeah, to Spanish movies, and, and hear it in the native language. And I feel so connected to my culture in that way. You know what I mean? I feel that. Does that mean, I, my brother doesn't speak, poor brother, I don't mean to out you. Um, he doesn't <laughs> speak Spanish. But that, does that make him less Latino? I don't think it does. I think there, in fact, there was a Pew study that showed recently that showed that I think 70% of Latinos don't feel that way. So I think those who do feel that way, I get it. But I don't necessarily think that that's true. I think the language is worth preserving. And this is what I tell young journalists all the time. Uh, those who are Latino in particular, I say, you know what, if you don't learn it and you don't speak it to your benefit, believe you that the colleague who's not, you know, who, who's taking the Spanish class, it's going to be used in their benefit. They'll say, oh, hey, I, I can take that assignment or I can go, you know, interview that person in Spanish because I've heard it, you know. So if I think it's important to us to conserve that and to continue to have that into our culture, because there are things that get lost in the translation, right? There are things that I love being able to, to kind of communicate with people on, you know, and it's not about talking about other people. It's just having that cultural connection, you know, and being able to, to, to switch in and out of the language with ease and with fluidez, you know what I mean? Like, that's something that I miss being able to do. So for me, um, yeah, I have colleagues here that we speak in Spanish, you know, all day. And that's just how it is, you know. So I don't think it makes you less Latino, but I wish we were able to preserve it more because I think it matters to us. So as you know, in media, there's been a shift, sort of a, a look into the future that's currently happening right now with Hispanics. Right now, the hot thing is English language Hispanics as opposed to Spanish. We're the hot Spanish. thing? Are we're, we the, we're, hot we're thing? the hot thing? Oh, my God. Right. Woo 
And I think a lot of that has to do with immigration has fallen flat for, I think, I believe since 2012. So the less immigration, especially if we have a Donald Trump as president, but ultimately what we're seeing is less Spanish dominant immigrants coming into the country and we're seeing more uh, immigrants, children having children and children. And so we're becoming more either bilingual or more native born and more English Hispanic. A lot of the media is also moving down that trend. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with it? that media should be embracing English language Hispanics or should they still be embracing the Spanish language Latino? I think we need both. I think we need both because a lot of us live in two worlds, right? As Latinos, um, especially if you're first, second, third generation, I think you still straddle a lot of those worlds. So I don't, I would hate to see Spanish language television go away. Um, and I, I, and I don't feel like we need to, and this is something when I, when I pitched the race beat to the times, I said, I don't want to create New York Times Latino per se. By the way, that exists. I know now. New now, York Times in Espanol. Yeah. Now it does. Yeah. Now it that does. That was one of the, uh, that's different. That's different. Right. I said, I didn't want to create English language content from the times for Latinos, but New York Times in Espanol, I actually pitched that to them. Many, many years and ago. And they told and you no, and, and now... No. And here we go. But you know what, guys? It. Maybe <laughs> next time... I'm just saying. <laughs> Te lo dije. Hashtag. Um, so, like, Spanish language content is important. But for the, the English sort of dominant Latino, I don't know. I don't... Yeah, there are some... Like, I like rem, uh, Remescla, right? Remescla.com, yeah. I think they do great. It's like, oh, this is interesting. And okay, they have they have smart stuff on there. Like, I enjoy it. I think there's enough... I think there's enough to go around. I guess I also... When I pitched this to the Times, I said, guys, I don't... I think we just want to expand our content to be more inclusive. We want to see stories about us that don't necessarily separate us from the rest of the United States. And I think you're seeing that on TV now, Right. You're seeing a lot of that diversifying of television, right, where it's not so strange to see a black female leading actress in a, in a television. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. A couple years ago, that oh wouldn't have happened. Yeah. That Kerry Washington, Viola Davis, God bless them. You know what I'm saying? It's Let's, still a problem in film, though. A huge problem in film. And, we are, and, I'm, and I think it, with emerging filmmakers, Latino emerging filmmakers, they're, they're trying to change the game. But in terms of mainstream films, I don't want to... I'm tired of being categorized as either ay, 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 <laughs> or, you know, estoy tan caliente. You know what I mean? Like, it's right. just the like... The Sofia Vergara yes, syndrome, right? Yes. You know, right. like, it's not... It's just... It's limiting and it's not... It's not the, the full representation of who I am or who we are. And I think, especially Spanish language TV and content, I think they're trying to do this with Fusion, but even in their own space. And, and I love Univision, but I also think we can change the game there, too. You know, I don't mind flipping back and forth between Univision and, and other mainstream content, right? Because I can do that. I'm bilingual. But there's a, there should be a reason to bring me there to you tune know? in right and i think Sabado they're figuring Gigante right figured that, that that's who it was for my grandparents right Sabado Gigante, we would all sit around and we would watch it and that would but for me i'm not necessarily gonna go right who is it that. who is it for our generation of hispanics i think that they're literally trying to figure it out as they go mm -hmm. and i think either a we embrace the transition and give them some time to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Or we act like New Yorkers, you know, with their sports teams. It has to be now. We got to win a championship now. <laughs> and so either that or we just say, look, we're going to go somewhere else. And so it might be 50-50. I think so. I mean, I think also, you know, wasn't there, like, I think what you're seeing with Narcos, right? I, I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but... They go back and forth with the languages. They go back and forth with language. And it's so normal and i remember it's normal for me to watch it's normal and i remember there was i think a couple when i was still media reporting at the times so there was a show that was that did that with a couple of its characters breaking bad did was that. it breaking yeah bad? it was breaking I, okay, bad so i remember yeah. people being like well how come they're not translating it or i didn't understand it's that authentic and i love that yeah and i was like you know what it's not about you <laughs> This part is about us. <laughs> yeah. That was meant for us. That yeah, was right. our cultural the code. insider, you know right. That's I mean? the right. wink. The right. wink, that right. Wink. Because that's how we live in the world. And guess what? So do you. Right. Like, if, if I'm speaking Spanish to somebody and you don't understand it, you're not going to stop me and say, well, what did you just Go say? Go learn some Spanish, buddy. Right. Right. And so I think, I think that's, that makes for a more authentic Latino media experience. Before I let you go, 
Uh, what are you working on? Which article? Which story are you working on now? Well, at we just published a story today that is. I know I'm the Debbie Downer here of the um, of of what we're looking at in terms of race and inequality. But I will say this: these numbers, guys, are really serious. A lot of what underpins my work is what's known as the racial wealth gap. Um, the numbers that underpin almost everything I do are white families in America have an average household wealth of $140,000. Latinos, 13,000, and African Americans, 11,000. So most of the work that you'll see coming out of my fingertips is looking at that. And, we're, and we looked at this, um, the report that we, we published on today, which I'll actually be moderating a panel about in Washington next week, is looking at the wage gap. So forget about wealth. Now we're just talking about how much people are getting paid per hour. And they looked at blacks and whites. They didn't um, analyze Latinos for this one. Um, their wage gap is more is about 25 percent. Blacks are getting paid that much less than whites are. And it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger since the 80s. There was a moment in the 90s when it got a little it's it, 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 it got a little closer. There was an increase in the minimum wage. There was a little bit more political will to enforce things like affirmative action. That's now changed. And so now we're at a point where and, and the researchers found that it wasn't education. They controlled for education. They controlled for experience. In none of those controls did they find that blacks were ever paid more um, than whites, whether they had the same level of education or the same level of experience. And we're talking men and women. So I'm trying to answer those questions with my work. And I think that when we look at discrimination, it plays out in many ways, microaggressions, but it also plays out in your pocket. Right. And that's a big thing for Latinos. It's a big thing for African Americans. And it's a big issue that we're not talking as much about in this political season. And we need to be. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thank I think you. it's important. I think it matters. And I think you're making a change. I so, hope so thank you once again. Thank you. You can connect with Tanzina on Twitter and see and read all of her current stories on CNN and CNNMoney.com right now. That's it for this seventh episode of Highly Relevant. I want to thank Mark Consuelos, Anthony Mendez, and Tanzina Vega for coming on the podcast. And I hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any suggestions on how I can improve the show, please email me at highlyrelevant at showbizcafe.com. That's highlyrelevant at showbizcafe.com. Also, if you like the podcast, share it and tell your friends to please subscribe, rate it, and leave a review. It makes a major difference in reaching a wider audience. We're also now on Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher for you Android users. See you again next Friday on another episode of Highly Relevant. Highly Relevant.